welcome to the 1145 session, Resilient Communications in the Era of Misinformation. We have a great panel here today. We have Michael Connery, Senior VP, Digital Innovation with Weber Shanwick. We have Renee DeRestas, Research Manager of Stanford Internet Observatory. James Nichols, co-founder of Nobody, and Todd Grossman, CEO of America's Hawk Walker. So I'll let them take it away. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for choosing this session. You all had a choice to come to sessions, and hopefully good information will be uh, well received. We actually had some time to speak earlier this week, and I'm really excited to um, share with you what we all want to talk about and how to be resilient in this time of misinformation, or some could say fake news and information. And with that being said, um, my company, TalkWalker, does a lot of listening out there. And some of the stats that we've found and uncovered in our social media trends report is that in the past year, since um, 2021, the beginning of 2021, 8 million um, posts out there have just been misinformation. And credibility index is really important. In addition to that, 65.4% of internet users out there are getting their information from Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And there are opportunities for brands and organizations to, to use this to reach their audiences, but there's also a really scary opportunity and a threat for misinformation to be uh, going to that audience. And I know everyone in this room are internet users and we all are getting our news in some shape or form, so we really have to be uh, mindful in terms of what we're doing and provide you with some strategies and as well as a company to be competitive in this um, area. So we have our panelists here. I'd like to ask uh, Renee first to introduce herself and explain a little bit at what she does at the Stanford Internet Laboratory. Hi, um, thanks for having me here today. I am at Stanford. I've uh, been a researcher there for about two and a half years now. Uh, the Internet Observatory is a multidisciplinary center within the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. And what we look at are uh, kind of four main things. We look at trust and safety issues online. So what are areas in which things like harassment or self-harm or some of the um, non-fake news uh, kind of aspects of online harms uh, take shape? What are the mechanisms by which they spread? How do they impact users? Uh, and you know, we have actually some engineering curriculum for undergrad students because we are a university um, teaching tools to, uh, to understand that. We then look at information environments, so mis- and disinformation, how do state actors and domestic actors use the information ecosystem. We look at what the emerging technologies are that transform the playing field across both of those. And then finally, we look at what are the policies that lawmakers and tech platforms uh, can, uh, can consider or can implement to mitigate the harms uh, as we identify them in the other kind of three areas of work. You are indeed an expert, and we will have time for Q&A at the end, and hopefully you'll ask some questions. Uh, Michael, can you share a little bit about what you're doing at Weber, Powell Tate? Sure. Uh, so I am a digital strategist and planner at Weber Shanwick, or Powell Tate, which is the public affairs division of Weber Shanwick. And for the past uh, year plus, I've been a part of what we call our media security team, which is a group of interdisciplinary people from across the network. It's data scientists, it's business analysts, strategists, creatives, crisis experts, all coming together to think about how we help our own clients deal with misinformation and navigate this new environment um, you know, through our own offerings or through partners that we work with, whether that's experts that we bring on board to consult with us, new technologies that we integrate with our own in order to uh, help find solutions. And uh, yeah, that, that's what we work on. Happy to be here today. James, tell us a little bit about you and Nobody. I'm James Nichols. I'm co-founder and president of Nobody. Um, so we're a strategy-led social media agency based in Washington, D.C. Um, we've carved out, carved out a bit of a niche working with Fortune 500 companies on kind of higher risk or, or um, more challenging topics, I would say. I wouldn't classify it all as crisis because, quite frankly, it's kind of persistent crisis today. The environment that we're in, on any given day, there's always some issue that's kind of bubbling up. Um, similar to Michael's team, uh, we have a media and insights group which kind of focuses on digital intelligence. Um, it's, it's a combination of kind of people, process, and technology. Um, we've definitely seen pretty sub significant kind of advancements in this space in the past three or four years, and, and happy to be here and share some of those stories. 
So let's get on with the first question. We often see that misinformation can be categorized in perhaps democracy or healthcare. However, why is it important for all types of businesses and industries to be prepared for misinformation? We'll start with you, Renee, please. <clears throat> So prior to going to Stanford, uh, I actually worked at a firm um, called Yonder that, that looked at exactly this question. And one of the things that we saw was while we were primarily focused on state actors at the time, uh, we were really interested in understanding how Russia and China in particular um, were using social media platforms to influence the conversation about particular American industries. Extractive industries was, uh, was one such area. Um, in fact, probably the main area at the time, back in 2015, the, the um, House Committee on Science and Technology was also documenting ways in which this was, uh, this was impactful. Um, GMO foods were another big area, uh, future of agriculture type things. Again, things where there were industries that had significant um, geopolitical impact, you would see state actors coming in and, and trying to manipulate the conversation around those uh, as they were fighting for um, contracts or um, you know, for, for particular types of use and relationships with governments. So there was a strong geopolitical component. Gradually, more and more people realized that anyone could use these systems, though, and so you started to see the presence of domestic actors and domestic, uh, you know, a lot of times it was trolls, um, but the, the presence of particular factions that had a strong political point of view and could leverage a company in service to a broader political aim. So they would trash the reputation of a company in service to a broader social point that they wanted to make. And that was where you started to see brands being impacted. The first one that I remember uh, being particularly prominent was um, when the movie Black Panther came out. Uh, at the time, we were starting to see some you know, really significant race conversations happening on Twitter. This was a movie that had inherently kind of a strong point of view. And what happened was that 4chan trolls began to insert themselves into the conversation in several unique and, 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 and harmful ways um, alleging that, you know, in, in some cases they were saying that um, white women were being beaten up at the movie theater and they would go and grab photos of domestic violence victims and, and tweet them and try to make them go viral, uh, saying that, that uh, hordes of people were beating up white women at the premieres for this movie. Um, there was then an even more kind of uh, insidious, uh, they created a, um, I think they called it, uh, it was a, I'm trying to remember what the hashtag was off the top of my head now, it was um, alleging that, um, that there should be an exodus back to Wakanda, a return to Africa. And so in the, it, the movie has this very idealized um, kind of place, and so they were alleging that black people should in fact go there, and so trying to create this like return, uh, the separatist movement type dynamic. Um, and there too, what you started to see was alleging that, um, that the Marvel, I believe, should be paying reparations to the black community to fund this uh, this exodus that they were advocating for, and they were pretending to be black people. They were creating fake black people accounts to do this, and so it was very, very destructive. Meanwhile, the movie, you know, um, Marvel had to decide what they were going to do about this. Are they going to respond to it? If you, you know, there was a lot of thinking at the time that if you responded to it, you were inadvertently amplifying it, which of course you are. Yet at the same time, if you do nothing, then it just perpetuates. And so these were the examples in which uh, what started out in the early days as state actors really leaning into geopolitical and, and, and uh, kind of heavy hitter um, international issues, the tactics were then picked up and democratized and you started to see all of the ways in which the culture war was being fought uh, targeting companies that were producing a product that was tangentially related or even directly related, had a particular strong point of view about American society, and creating manipulation campaigns to trash the, repu to trash the reputations of those companies, and then by extension, weaken support for the social position that they were taking. The NFL also, during the um, Colin Kaepernick uh, kneeling, um, kind of, you know, when that was a, a major topic of conversation, we also saw the same types of trolls going in and, and producing content around that. So. The, it really was kind of democratized and brought down to a um, very pervasive level across all social issues. When we were speaking, we were talking about trolling and a little bit of the whack-a-mole effect. Does anyone want to comment to that or any experience that they have with that? Uh, sure, I can weigh in. I mean, I think what you're referring to is like, how, how do we know when a brand should step in or not? When is a intervention useful or versus futile or you know even harmful in and of itself? Exactly. And it's very situational, I would say. Um, you know, typically what we look at is uh, a few different things. Number one, um, what is being said? You know, is is it something where the company or brand has to say something? Uh, you know, where it would be a huge miss for them 
not to, or they're going to be put on the spot by media, and we know that they're going to have to respond in some way or another. Um, that's one category that we look at. Uh, another is, um, you know, there's there are ways to respond where the brand does not necessarily have to put themselves out there in a very big way. So as one example, um, we have a client in the vaccine space. We did a look back over the past year just to try and understand the narratives around their brand and what was happening. And we found a lot of really interesting things, um, which I'm happy to talk about. But one thing in particular was we found old narratives um, that uh, were examples of people trying to spread misinformation that never really caught on. Um, but were never addressed either. So mm. it was an instance where we were able to help them craft a response that they could put up on their website, uh, that they could bring to Reuters or other fact-checking organizations to get a third-party voice to put out there a authoritative response such that that never came back and bit them later, like we call it a zombie narrative that just gets recycled again and again and again. Um, the brand can make an effective intervention without putting themselves out there in a big way. And then the last... Uh, thing that we tend to look at is, um, you know, for the particular audience that's being exposed to a message, who is credible with them? Uh, a lot of times the brand maybe is not the credible voice, but there are local people from the community, and by community I mean, you know, potentially a geographic community, but also a cultural community, people who have the same values, beliefs, and experiences. And we try and find uh, influencers who can play that authoritative role and maybe speak to the issue, not necessarily on behalf of the brand, but on behalf of the good of the community. James, do you want to add when one maybe should yeah. step aside or um, do in, something about in, it? In 2017 was probably the first time we saw misinformation at scale with one of our clients. We get a call uh, from a uh, tech company, so you're talking about industries which are being affected, um, and they were getting 20,000 tweets a day, uh, which had all these conspiracy theories and comments about their company, and none of them were true. They knew there was a problem. They knew it was trolls and bots and so forth, but they weren't really sure how to kind of wrap their hands around it. And today, we have much more sophisticated tools, but at the time, we were kind of using a pretty standard off-the-shelf like social listening tool. Um, and what we figured out is what we, we, kind of, we affectionately called it the troll tracker, which we built a, a kind of a series of levels which said uh, these are just kind of these bots or anonymous users that uh, kind of all speak in a chorus and just retweet each other, and it's clearly automated their goal is to be validated by someone who has more authority, right? So if they can get the attention of, um, let's say, a, a member of Congress or a, a, a media personality of some sort, then it gives some credibility to their message. And over time, we set up these mechanisms to measure, like, how, how loud are the trolls being? Um, in this instance, what we ultimately determined is all the activity is happening on Twitter. We shifted the client's strategy to effectively quarantine the trolls on Twitter. We shifted to LinkedIn and to other platforms. And so um, also to kind of address the whack-a-mole, um, we worked directly with Twitter and identified these 10,000 accounts or so that were kind of re responsible for a lot of the activity. Uh, but what we found is as soon as they shut them down, they just propagated a new several thousand accounts. And so it's definitely a challenge. Um, and it's an evolving space, but yeah, that was kind of our mm -hmm. first exposure in 2017. You call the 1-800 number at Twitter, or who, who do you call over there? Yeah, hey, it, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, there's there's kind of brand safety teams at Twitter that are kind of focused on this. I think it's it's an interesting point in that um, oftentimes social sits inside of marketing teams or brand teams, but these issues are not exactly marketing, right? If someone's kind of monitoring comments on a Facebook page, if that's a social customer care person they may see someone equating 5G to cancer and just be like, well, that person doesn't have their, they're a little loony or whatever. In reality, what they may be seeing is a misinformation campaign that's coordinated in that scale. And so the teams that work on this are, are typically not the traditional teams that you would associate with like a community manager or something that deals with these topics. Right. Have you dealt with um, legal advisors as well or law firms as well in helping with these matters? Is, is are they part of the team? Yeah, for sure, especially when it is uh, a company that's being attacked directly. So we've had a number of instances where companies have had issues with old employees or, uh, you know, information gets leaked in some way and distorted online. And, um, you know, having a legal partner and a strategy, whether that's for, um, you know, dealing with misinformation coming from an ex-employee or even just having a team focused on, um, you know, 
takedowns and getting things removed from yeah. specific platforms. Um, it's definitely part of the toolbox, particularly when you're in a crisis scenario where you know the misinformation is very easy to identify and it's attacking the company directly. How long would it take or what have you seen in your experience for something to get taken down? Does it normally happen? Does it not? Um... Uh, varies by platform and who you can get to with the platform and how serious they right. think it is. So let's talk about the, the platforms for, for all the panelists. Uh, what is your take in terms of are the platforms doing enough to create policies and safety teams and where do you think it's heading? So um, we work with the platforms at Stanford. Uh, this is with um, both data sharing relationships. It's pretty common in academia for certain types of research institutions that do the work that I do to have these relationships. Um, we work with the integrity teams. And so the integrity team is a little bit different than the brand management team in that um, the integrity team's job is to understand the substance of the network and to work specifically on um, sophisticated coordinated campaigns, what we call coordinated and authentic behavior. Uh, that's Facebook's phrase, but it, uh, it, it's kind of adopted by the, uh, by the broader tech industry at this point. Coordinated um, in the sense that there is a, an actual campaign. It's not an organic um, coming together of grassroots sentiment. Um, inauthentic and in that there's an element of inauthenticity where that means either fake accounts or attempts to manipulate an algorithm or a distribution channel uh, or you know, the, the entities are not what they seem. We look at what are called actors, behaviors, and content. Um, we used to call it content voice and dissemination, but ABC is a much nicer mnemonic. Um, so who is behind it? What are they doing? And the content is really the last piece because you don't want to necessarily be uh, alleging that a network is inauthentic because of what they're saying. Um, because there, you know, it kind of spans the political spectrum. Oftentimes there are very strong kind of political elements to, again, even when they're going after brands, there's some sort of political uh, claim that they're making. And so the platforms are very wary of taking down something based on a viewpoint uh, or, a, you know, or, or something along those lines. So we try to find elements of inauthenticity there. What we do with the uh, integrity teams, we've, we've done this, um, we choose high harm areas because otherwise you're boiling the ocean. And so for Stanford in particular, we focus on elections, focus on health misinformation. We work as part of consortiums with other research institutions. We do work with US government as well. Um, again, the idea that the best mechanisms for detection and, uh, and coming up with a whole of society response involve bringing all the various stakeholder types together. Uh, so an example would be, you know, we find evidence of a network that appears to be coordinated. There is a use of a particular hashtag on Twitter. Oftentimes you'll see it on Twitter first. It's just easier. We can ingest um, using the, the APIs that researchers have access to to try to understand, make sense of particular types of conversations. Sometimes there's um, kind of like an uncanny valley component to it. We were talking with, uh, we speak to State Department a lot about the manifestations internationally. Um, you'll see something that's just not quite right. And it's very hard uh, to, um, to, to <laughs> it's, it's nice when you have those moments because it, it kind of sends off just enough of like, this doesn't seem quite right, makes you kind of dig into the network a little bit more. But then what happens is those accounts are flagged for the platforms. This is what we do, we'll say, hey, something appears to be not quite right here. Their integrity teams will then take them and look at them. And then we will jointly, if their integrity teams agree that something is not quite right, that there is some element of inauthenticity, um, we will then generally collaborate on doing the analysis and the cross-platform network. And that's because we speak to each integrity team individually. The integrity teams speak to each other as well. So there is communication between the platforms at this point. None of this existed in 2018. This is all uh, relatively recent as we've tried to come up with constructs for making this better. And then sometimes the networks you know, will, will say, this looks financially motivated as opposed to this looks politically motivated. If something looks financially motivated, oftentimes it'll be pushed into a different type of channel because then it's not an influence campaign to manipulate the public into thinking or doing or believing a particular thing. It falls more in the realm of um, the Macedonian teenagers running fake news sites, just trying to capitalize on American polarization to make people click on ridiculous articles to take them to a site with heavy ad load. That is an annoyance, but it is not considered quite so significant as 
a Russian operation to manipulate an election uh, by putting out content about a particular political party ahead of, you know, a month before the vote. So there's, there's different spectrums within the government. And when things are targeting brands specifically, again, what we look at is, um, is there an element of inauthenticity and is it likely politically motivated or ideologically motivated, which is a different degree of, uh, of, of challenge. The brand might not feel it that way, but uh, <laughs> versus is it something that's, uh, that's financially motivated, which then gets routed into kind of a different, different thread? I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and, and from our point in advising clients, um, you know, we take the perspective that, yes, the platforms are doing things. Um, they're investing a lot of resources into it. Um, whether that's enough resources, uh, you know, when you stand it next to the scope of the problem is a conversation we could have for an entire session. Um, but particularly when those issues span gray areas and it's not an issue of national security or public health, uh, you know, our perspective is that the platforms may help you, they may help, they may not, they may help you in your own time, which is not helpful. So we don't rely on them. It's again, one piece of a response protocol, but we need to be thinking about this um, you know, in terms of what the brand can do themselves, marshalling its own resources and, you know, maybe engaging a larger community, whether that's the industry that the brand is in or, you know, the larger audience that they're, they're trying to address. Uh, James, um, you want... Uh, I was just going to say, I completely agree. I think, I think the brands need to assume that you're probably not going to get help from the platform because they have bigger kind of fish to fry on different issues. Um, we've seen a couple of examples in terms of, like, platforms have tried to make some pretty sweeping changes. So a good example is like issue ads, which have been kind of either adjusted or banned on Twitter or Facebook. There's been a lot of organizations, foundations and so forth that talk about these issues and then they want to promote these issues to their stakeholders, but they're kind of banned from doing so because Facebook or Twitter has to kind of have a blanket policy. Uh, and another example, which doesn't rise to the level of kind of nation states attacking uh, our democracy, um, I came across a scenario recently on Nextdoor, which kind of doesn't really seem like a place that you'd have misinformation, uh, but you have these communities where there's conversations happening. Um, so I was speaking to a group, uh, kind of an economic development group, and they said they're just getting totally beat up on Nextdoor in these communities with misinformation. And there's no currently a great mechanism with which to point out that it's, it's, it's invalid or completely made up. And so you have these very... Um, kind of vocal minorities who are running rampant inside of next door. Again, it doesn't seem like a place that you would normally find misinformation. Um, and there's not really a great solution right now. Like there's community moderators, you can you can report those things, but how many key, how many communities can you be a member of in next door and just based on the way it's structured? So misinformation can happen at scale and also can happen discreetly at a community level. And depending on uh, your organization, it could it could be challenging either way. Yeah. So. We didn't mention Reddit at all. Have you guys run into Reddit? Well, how's that coming up? And maybe like hyping the stocks and things like that. Is that forum in place for Reddit to really be effective? There's, um, it's everywhere. And, you know, Nextdoor is one example, of course. But, but it, it is literally everywhere. And that's because it's, campaigns are targeted at, at audiences. And so if you want to reach a particular audience, you're going to go to where that audience is. And so we see... Um, we see TikTok uh, is, a, is, a, is a common front at this point. We did a takedown um, alongside, I believe it was Twitter and Facebook for this one of a Jordanian army operation where they were on TikTok as well, right? And you wouldn't necessarily think that TikTok would be the place for the Jordanian army to, you know, they were, they were running kind of an, in, uh, an inauthentic propaganda campaign bolstering the, uh, you know, we love the Jordanian army. Uh, it, incredibly stupid because it's the sort of thing that you could see the army doing quite legitimately with overt accounts is the, the way the American armed forces do, you know, pride, nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing abnormal about that. But what they chose to do instead was uh, create fake young people and create fake young people accounts on a variety of platforms, including TikTok, and then post this kind of like pro-army propaganda 
And the reason it got taken down, of course, is because of the element of inauthenticity. These are not real people. They don't exist. Uh, but we found them because they had also put these fake people up on Twitter, and they had also put these fake people up on Facebook. And so as we were tracing the network and looking at the assets, because it is effectively a marketing campaign, many of these propaganda campaigns, you know, the relationship between propaganda and marketing, I assume I don't have to tell the people here, right, is, is a <laughs> there's that history. And so you really do see that manifesting in, in continued ways. And, and so they're literally everywhere. Uh, we see um, domestic campaigns, because, of course, propaganda can be produced by anybody now, including bottom-up ideologues in the U.S. Yes. Um, you'll see them on Parler, you'll see them on Gab, you know, you'll see them in places where if they want to reach a right-wing audience, there are now dedicated social platforms that enable that. Um, we don't see quite the same on the left. There's a platform called MeWe, which is a little bit niche, uh, and, and some of the um, kind of the more left-wing conspiracy theory, kind of like the health woo type stuff has long uh, been situated there, and so people who want to find those audiences can go there. Uh, Telegram is a big space. Reddit, again, most of the major platforms have integrity teams now, and Reddit has an integrity team as well. Anybody that was touched directly by the Russian operation from 2015 to 2018 created an integrity team uh, or a system for dealing with it because they didn't want to have a recurrence of that, particularly ahead of the 2020 election, uh, 2018, 2020, and now 2022. Um, and so Reddit also has a team responsible for looking at these things and Reddit, interestingly, also, though, we see their content. We've seen GRU operations on there. We've seen um, Saudi and Brazilian operations on there. Again, international audiences, broad-spectrum communities, the ability to reach people who have self-declared an area of interest by joining a particular subreddit and following a particular topic. Um, but again, the interesting thing is the Uncanny Valley piece of it it means that the people in the Reddit community are so deep in understanding the kind of cultural context of their community, how they speak, the language they use, the media sources they trust, the influencers that resonate with them, that when these inauthentic accounts come in, um, what you'll see a lot of the time is they get caught because they haven't done the work to deeply embed within the community. Russia is the one exception to that. With Russia, we see this sustained commitment to a long game um, domestic ideologues already have that resonance and that, and that cultural familiarity, so domestic ideologues um, are effective as well. But a vast array of the others just, you know, they get, they have no, um, no clout, and so they go, they go nowhere. Their stuff doesn't get upvoted, it doesn't get engaged with. So it's important to also remember that you can see evidence of an operation, but that's not necessarily evidence of an impactful operation. Nobody authentic picked it up and ran with it, and, uh, and that's one of the interesting dynamics when we evaluate these things. Yeah, I think when we think about this less from the perspective of are they on this platform, are they on that platform, and more as a data problem, can we get the data from the platform to do an analysis? And when we, um, you know, look at our own contracts with various different uh, platforms or listening technologies, you know, we're constantly looking at what access do they have to the APIs and the data from all of those? What does that allow us to see? What can we not see? Do we need human expertise to take a look into any one particular platform where we have a data void? Um, and then, uh, you know, to Renee's point, it's all about, uh, you know, how do we then analyze that data? Are we seeing that information is jumping from one platform to another and it is getting upvoted or spread by what look like real people behaving in real ways? Or is it all a bunch of bots behaving like bots and it's isolated by itself in, in a corner and it looks really scary, but at the end of the day, it's not really having a huge impact. But for us, at the end of the day, um, there is a technology stack behind all of this that you pair with humans in order to be able to understand what's happening. And for you know each platform, it's, it's a data issue. What are they willing to share with us? And what are we able to um, analyze and get from that data? So let's talk about technology stacks. I know we all have our um, with the technology company, and we do that listening. We actually work with Weber on a global level. However, there's tons of different technologies that you can use, and it'd be great to share those freemium type services and those that are paid for, and where one can go to to get resources because it's just it's just tremendous. All of this amount of information out there and platforms, AI has to help with this. Uh, I'll maybe go first. So. All of our clients have TalkWalker or Sprinkler or BrandWatch, kind of one of the enterprise-grade social listening tools. Um, I completely echo everything they were saying with respect to data. In order to correctly kind of identify and, and measure and evaluate misinformation, 
uh, it generally requires a lot more data than probably what teams are used to ingesting and processing because you almost need to take a couple broader steps back to look at the communities or look at the conversations and see the different cohorts or narratives um, <coughs> that are emerging within those conversations. And so we're, we're seeing kind of the emergence of um, almost a, a, a new suite of technologies that are more in the algorithm space that are specifically designed for identifying toxicity, identifying inauthentic conversation, um, that, and, and, and TalkWalker and Sprinkler, everyone's working on it too, but there's some really interesting technologies that are coming out of the intelligence community, which are kind of being repurposed, previously were, were used to identify the state actors and so forth, um, and they're becoming more broadly available. So I know Michael does a lot of work in this space, so. Yeah, uh, you know, we have vet and now work with a lot, a pretty wide array of vendors and um, clients are always cost conscious. So, you know, there's a wide array of price points as well. So, you know, we have a few that, uh, you know, like News Whip, uh, where they're able to, uh, you know, help identify misinformation that is potentially going to spread within a 24 hour period um, on, you know, more traditional, more traditional news stories that are gonna, gonna get traction. And, you know, it's a very low price point and it's a very simple way to just, uh, you know, subtly level up what you're able to do. Um, on the other end, uh, you know, we have an extensive partnership with a group called Blackbird AI that comes out of the defense industry. And, you know, we work with them on, um, you know, some pretty sophisticated modeling of, you know, activity that's happening across, you know, many different platforms, breaking it down into many different narratives and sub-narratives, bot-like activity, synthetic media. So it, it's really a broad range and, but I, what I'll say is it's not just about the technology. Like I would, I would not advise anyone to just go out and buy a tool and think you're gonna have all of this solved. It's about knowing how to use that tool, how to integrate it with or pair it with maybe the analytics work that you're already doing, uh, but also how you bring subject matter expertise into it. Like we never just have an analyst sit down with the tool. We always pair that person with uh, someone who is a subject matter expert in whatever issue we're talking about. Um, you know, to Renee's point that lots of these communities have their own languages and, you know, cult culture. We have an effort across the agency to understand who among our people are embedded in those cultures. Like, are you super interested in, uh, you know, some niche community and you're on Reddit? Are you, you know, in some small community on TikTok that maybe is going to become exposed? We're trying to gather all of that together so that we know who can we reach out to in the network to pair with the analyst and with the tool to get the best understanding of what's happening. So we have um, research institution, it means we have access to a couple different things. So first we have access to students of all backgrounds uh, at all levels of, of education. So we have undergrad research assistants that work with us, we have graduate students uh, who work with us, uh, we have professors in other departments who work with us. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we can serve as a partner on information operations research related to where there's a lot of, um, you know, there was a, um, <clears throat> uh, we needed people who understood the politics of Armenia recently. We, you know, there, these are the sorts of things where that deep domain expertise doesn't reside within our core team of about 20. We pull from the university broader community when we have something we need to look at. Indian politics, who has a deep, deep understanding of the full spectrum array of what is happening ahead of an election. Uh, we've had times where we've had, to, where we've had real struggles. Ethiopia, the Ethiopian election, where how do we find people fluent in the dialects and the, that this propaganda and that this content is coming out in? Uh, it's not even machine translatable sometimes. There are certain types of character sets that have just been neglected because the audience base isn't very large. You may have heard about this in the context of some of Facebook's um, disasters in Myanmar, right? Um, and so what we try to do is bring in that, that deep domain expertise. We bring on postdocs who have particular thematic areas that they're looking at, and so we do have core focuses that for us span about a year to, to two years. That's just how we work as a research institution. When we're doing something like looking at an election, we use a multi-research institution model, usually about four, four, between four to six different research institutions. So we work with NYU, we work with UW. Um, each of us has a different competency and a different focus on what we do, called, we call it ingest, where we build our own tech. So we also have a tech team at SIO in addition to the subject matter expertise or the regional or language expertise, we also have tech expertise. For us, we don't build anything that's 
pretty. So we use like a bunch of Jupyter notebooks. You know, we're using a lot of like very rough stuff that helps us do the analysis. There is no need to produce a dashboard for a client, so that's not what we focus our work on. We focus on anomaly detection. What are methodologies? What are statistical ways that we can surface new information, track how things hop across communities? Um, we do this as, as computer science research also, right? It goes out in academic papers, the methodologies as well as the findings. So it's a little bit different for us. We don't actually, there was, when we first started, there was the build versus buy conversation. And we ultimately went with build because there were just certain niche types of things that we were going to do that are not relevant to most uh, public, you know, public facing kind of software production. Um, and then there's the budget thing, right? Which is, uh, you know, we, uh, we are academic, so we don't have the, um, the massive uh, contracts with some of the social listening companies, and that's just how we've um, how we've structured it. So it's it's a it's a slightly different way of doing things, um, <clears throat> but we try to communicate out our findings to the relevant civil society organizations because, as both of my co-panelists noted, uh, if you're not trained in these things, one of the things that we see very often is flagging of things that you know we're I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this, but it's um, this is a thing I disagree with on the internet, so I'm going to flag it. Um, and so taking input and taking tips from communities, we have to kind of filter for that and try to, so we do trainings alongside like National Conference on Citizenship, who's one of our election integrity partners, where they're trying to teach community reporters how to think about uh, what is potentially mis or disinformation versus what is a politically oriented framing that they might disagree with. And how do we, uh, how do we like, train the public to think about these things as they see them and where those lines are. And it's not always a clearly delineated bright line. And so we, again, for us, it's a, uh, how do we bring all of the various institutions that we can together in a, in a context around elections and public health, usually. So um, there are 80% of posts that have a logo in it don't even mention the company or brand by name. So that involves using image recognition, speech to text, um, voice to text uh, recognition, which is possible now, um, video recognition. Are you getting into that area and using that to try to uncover misinformation? I'll just give you a monitoring. Uh, TikTok is kind of the, the most challenging one that we hear. For, like our clients are like, when are we gonna get TikTok? And with respect to the data conversation earlier, like Reddit, for example, in the past couple of years has done a very good job of making their data far more accessible via APIs. And so while I still think the tools, the social listening tools and so forth, kind of struggle with the architecture of Reddit data to where the filtering and so forth makes it a little challenging, it is there. Whereas TikTok is just still a bit of a black box. We're starting to see some progress there. Um, but what we've seen in terms of uh, video recognition and brands and so forth, the scale of kind of bad news on TikTok, it's, it's sharing at a rate and a speed that is sometimes 100 to 1 on other platforms. Yep. And so um, that's, I would say, it doesn't keep me up at night because it's just a challenge we're going to need to sort through. But that's the one when I've spoken to people who are building the algorithms and doing the detection and so forth, TikTok's the one that kind of... Is the biggest. I don't know. If you the, have any this, this was not planned yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, we just announced that we can monitor with TikTok. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it, everyone was saying TikTok. When are you going to get TikTok? TikTok, TikTok. It was yesterday awesome. that that was announced. <laughs> so we'll talk later. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question uh, before we open it up to you guys. Uh, this is for all of you. Uh, what skills do you need to assemble teams to tackle misinformation? Basically, it's your departments, I would say, but is there anything specific or the types of profile you're looking for for an individual that's really into? I mean, it's, it's no one person. It's a cross-functional team, and you definitely want people that can think on their feet and adapt because it's always changing. But in terms of the skill sets we look at, um, you know, teams pretty much always have a data scientist, an analyst who's used to manipulating the outputs from the data scientist, the subject matter expert, um, we're putting a lot of work into training our strategists on cognitive biases and the psychology of misinformation to help craft effective responses. Because to your whack-a-mole question at the beginning, you can't just state the facts and get it out there. Like You have to address the root cause of why someone might want to believe a piece of misinformation in some way. Um, crisis experts are always involved. And then um, uh, comms planning experts, people who can really think about campaigns 
cross channel and in terms of both online and offline activations because without all of those pieces um, you know you risk missing something or not being effective in your response Renee or James anything to add on that uh, no we um <clears throat> we do trainings for our undergrad RAs that focus on um, Again, the, the cognitive biases thing I think is very important and understanding the psychology is important. Um, we do a lot of uh, peer mentorship, so we'll have more senior uh, people, we call them tier one versus tier two analysts and then managers, um, who, are, who give feedback on uh, tickets that are, you know, that kind of make their way into the system when we're doing an election monitoring project. Is this in scope for us? Is this, uh, is this actually misinformation? Is there a falsifiable claim here or is this, a, a politically angled framing that is, you know, that falls more under the rubric of a, of a political expression as opposed to demonstrably false claims. So we, we spend a lot of time on that. Um, we run an open source intelligence class actually for students at Stanford. That's one of the things. So we, one of our um, uh, one of our workflows, as I mentioned at the start, is is actually to train people in trust and safety engineering in um, uh, in, in best practice methodologies. And so we do kind of walk through. Um, here's how you geolocate something. Here's how you track a transaction on the blockchain. You know, there's a bunch of these different sorts of things that we that we focus on teaching our analysts how to do. Uh, but ultimately, it is building those um, those interdisciplinary teams. I was just going to add. So, open source intelligence. That's kind of the the new hire that I would say we've had in the last two years, where we didn't, as a social media agency, it wasn't necessarily something that was on our radar. But being in conversations with our clients and just kind of seeing the skill sets that are there, people coming from the intelligence community. DC is obviously a pretty good place for that, and so um, it, it offers them a bit of a, a career change and so forth, but I wholeheartedly agree. It's not only kind of having a cross-disciplinary team, but we talk a lot about tools and so forth. I've had friends who run other agencies ask, like, well, what tool do you use? And that, that's, that's not a great idea. It's almost like a, a bad way to start the conversation because in reality, it's probably half a dozen tools. Some are scrappy and lightweight, others are more kind of robust, but it's also like kind of, it could be a really great sports car, but if you don't know how to drive it, then it doesn't matter. And so the analysts, the strategists, and all those other things really count, so. Thank you. Let's open it up for Q&A. We have five minutes before lunch. Any questions, anyone in the audience? Yes. Uh, is LinkedIn safe? Have you seen misinformation on LinkedIn? That's a great question. Uh, we have seen misinformation on LinkedIn. Um, I will say, and Renee may have more insight than I do here, um, it comes up a lot less frequently than others, but yes, we've seen it. We've seen networks um, out of China create LinkedIn profiles to serve as backstops for aliases that they put on other platforms. So more of a persona development um, process. Very thin, low effort actually, really um, they all claimed to work for the same company and um, and they all had very similar language in their job descriptions, uh, which was sort of, if you're gonna do it, do it right. <laughs> so you know, if you're gonna expend the effort, like, you know, I, I don't know, we see things sometimes where we're like, why even bother, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard to um, monitor uh, LinkedIn. Their API is closed, except if your own LinkedIn page, you can monitor that. But otherwise, it's pretty tight. You had a question back there? I would say interventions are different depending on every situation. And as we said, you know, intervention is not even the right thing to do all the time. Um, certainly not directly, but more indirect, indirect means. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say there's any particular quality. What we try and do is just get to the emotional and psychological root behind specific narratives. Like if there are 10 pieces of misinformation that are floating around as part of a larger narrative, what are the things that they're playing off of? What are the fears, desires um, that maybe would get someone to want to agree with it or share it? And how, how are they latching onto it maybe as part of their, you know, another piece of their identity? And then we work with our strategists to say, hey, if this is the root cause, what is the, you know, what is the flip side of that? What is a way to tap into that same root cause in a more positive way? And what does that message look like for our brand? 
Um, and then if it's appropriate for a brand to weigh in or launch some kind of campaign, you know, we'll try and base the campaign around that particular insight. So again, we're not, um, we're not necessarily trying to whack down every single thing that's being said. We're more going out there with a positive message that's going to be a counterweight to the, to the, the misinformation. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, they wouldn't outsource that. That's that's considered again. They're they're hiring out of uh, ex, out of the XIC, um, you know, a few ex FBI agents. I can think off the top of my head, some academics, um, folks who have experience. Again, because the integrity teams are primarily focused on the most sophisticated actors. There's also um, there's also the folks who work on what are called dangerous organizations, and those two usually will come from some sort of law enforcement or intelligence background. Again, understanding the mechanics of certain types of, um, they're using the platforms to propagate, but these aren't new groups, and so there's like a desire to have that kind of thing. So they wouldn't um, they wouldn't outsource their their integrity teams. You see outsourcing more for like content moderation, um, and and you know using agencies to. Uh, to, to sort of serve with the stuff that people are reporting. The integrity teams are often proactively investigating, trying to understand uh, dynamics. You know, there's an election coming up in Ethiopia. Who is monitoring that? The integrity team is responsible for it, and so they'll be doing the proactive digging to try to see if there's something happening. Well, it's 1230. I want to thank you all for attending and thank our panelists, Renee, Michael, and James. Thank you so much for coming.